The modern video game industry has a lot of negative aspects. I mean, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a good chance you're well aware. But today we want to take a look at some potential trends, uh, 10 good positive things that we think, if they continue, can really shake up and disrupt the industry for the better. Let's get started off with number 10. We got to acknowledge No Man's Sky. There's a lesson to be learned with this game and, I think, a net benefit. No Man's Sky launched, as you probably know, as an undercooked game. It wasn't the ambitious space epic that players were promised and a lot of extremely hyped up players were disappointed with what they bought. This was not okay, to be clear. It wasn't good. People were rightfully not happy. But the developers Hello Games put their money where their mouth is and eventually surfaced with massive updates that gradually changed the entire game. More multiplayer support, more worlds, vehicles, a whole base building system, a redesigned quest line, tweaked graphics, a third person view mode. All these additions were completely free and the game blossomed into the really cool thing that players were initially excited about before launch. And it even kind of went beyond that. The game is really cool now. This is a very good, positive thing. It is divisive though. I mean, customers should absolutely get the thing they were promised when it releases, when they spend money on it. But if a game can find a second life and ultimately survive and become drastically better and find new players, that just means ultimately at the end of the day, there's another good game out there. And honestly, that's a thing that needs to continue. Games getting a second shot at life is good. I mean, like we've seen it with other games like Siege where it launched okay and eventually became a big, huge thing. Even Fortnite launched as kind of a wet blanket at first. No Man's Sky, of course, is a very different case, but overall, I, I think this is something that is becoming a trend and should be applauded when absolutely necessary in special cases. But next over at number nine, you like free stuff? I mean, you definitely do. Who doesn't? Uh, we, we've seen more games put more and more out there in terms of free updates and support, and we definitely don't want that to go away. We want that to continue. Like, for example, look at last year's Spider-Man on PS4. Now, sure, if you wanted more story content, you could buy in and get some extra story DLC expansions, but even if you didn't, you still got some cool extra suits for free. Like, remember that really cool suit from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies that everyone was freaking out about? It came into the game totally free. The Far From Home Spider-Man suits, totally free. Even the webbed and Fantastic Four ones, totally free. And over on Xbox, you're seeing it too. Sea of Thieves has been actively adding tons of new content, cosmetics, and even whole new game modes completely for free. Like, say what you will about your enjoyment of these games in particular, but there's no denying that it's a breath of fresh air to just get cool new content in the form of free updates rather than having to shell out to get them, and we definitely want to see more of it from other games in the future. And look, I know nothing in this world comes for free, but having some free stuff sometimes definitely makes it feel better. Next up at number 8, the road to backwards compatibility in the PS4 Xbox One era has been rocky to say the least. Eventually, Microsoft offered 360 and even eventual Xbox backwards compatibility through software emulation and downloads, offering a continually updating list of compatible games that only recently ended. PlayStation has been a bit behind on the whole thing on their end. You can buy some digital PS2 games and play them on the console, but really there's no put the disc in and download it again option like there is on Xbox. On top of that, the only way to play PS3 games on the platform is to do it through Sony's PlayStation Now, which isn't perfect. But a big reason for the lack of backwards compatibility this generation is the difference in hardware architecture. We're gonna move towards a now more standard x86 option, so given the next console should be running the same architecture in that regard, it would stand to reason that the PS4 to PS5 and Xbox One to Xbox Scarlet backwards compatibility should be more or less given. With Xbox head Phil Spencer saying the following, when we started on the Project Scarlet plan, I want it to do the same thing. I want to respect the OG Xbox games that are backwards compatible. I want to respect the 360 games that are also. I want to respect your Xbox One games that are backwards compatible. The idea of what generation did this game come from, I want that to go away. At the same time, I want developers to be able to make the best use of the hardware that's there so they can build amazing looking games. Sony, on the other hand, has been more or less radio silent on details of the next generation PlayStation on all fronts, so at this point, we can only speculate and hope that the company follows suit. On Sony's end, what we do know so far is that PS4 to PS5, that will be a thing. That is backwards compatible. Going further than that, though, from PS3 and PS2, we don't know yet, but still. The fact that console makers are aware that they're churning out another console when some people People only just got the last console and they're working around that by making things compatible that's a good thing next at number seven let's talk about a cool good thing Warframe did that should really set an example going forward this was revealed in a no clip documentary that took us behind the scenes of developer digital extremes 
Now, you know, Warframe is a free-to-play game with paid microtransactions in it. That's how they make money. In the documentary, though, the developers talk about trying to find a balance and, you know, making sure the game isn't too grindy just to force people to spend money. But one microtransaction in particular caught them off guard. At one point in the game, there was the ability to spend real-world money to get a random skin cosmetic for an in-game pet. It came out to costing less than a dollar for a try, but the developers were really alarmed when the data showed that one player bought this microtransaction 200 times. This made them quickly realize that they had essentially made a slot machine lever to pull that was essentially preying on some people with addictive tendencies. So they pretty swiftly decided to remove it in a patch update. Honestly, nice going guys. With the talks of microtransactions in so many games that aren't even free to play, this is a relevant conversation and we'd like to see stuff like this and this consideration happen more in games. But next up at number six, the Assassin's Creed series has always been, you know, deeply rooted in real world history, even if it does take a lot of weird creative license and do their own spin. But the craft of the actual in-game world, especially in the past few games, has been really, really incredibly rich and detailed and just cool to walk around and explore. That's a big reason why we're so into the Discovery Tour mode that Ubisoft started adding with 2017's Assassin's Creed Origins. So if you're not familiar with Discovery Tour, it's an optional mode that lets you just hang out and explore the world without combat or quests in a threat-free environment that serves as sort of a kind of virtual museum that gives you a ton of information and things like guided tours and stuff like that. Basically, you can either just roam around or you can select various tours and characters from the menu and it just guides you through things in the in-game world. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is set to get its own Discovery Tour update later this year and on top of all the stuff already featured in Origins, it will give you things like interactive quizzes and stuff on a range of topics that you can learn about in-game. It's just been super cool seeing people on Twitter and the like showing the game and this mode being used in classrooms or, or with relatives as an actual legitimate learning tool. And we definitely hope to see it show up again and hopefully be expanded in later entries and maybe just completely different games. Education and learning and being smart, that stuff is cool. I never did much of it, but I appreciate that it's here. Next up at number five, let's be real here. Getting a company to replace a defective item is usually a nightmare, especially when it comes to video games or electronics and cell phones. Uh, recently, Nintendo has taken a more consumer-friendly approach. After the whole Joy-Con drift issue really blew up, opting to no longer charge for repairs when you send in your defective drifting Joy-Con controller in for, you know, repair or replacement. On top of that, the company is going to refund all of the fees associated with the repairs prior to the implementation of the policy. Wow. In an official report from Vice based on a leaked memo, it was stated that, and I quote, customers will no longer be requested to provide proof of purchase for Joy-Con repairs. Additionally, it is not necessary to confirm warranty status. If a customer requests a refund for previously paid Joy-Con repair, confirm the prior repair, and then issue a refund. Now, this isn't the first time Nintendo has done something like this either. You might remember the issues with launch Switch units where the left Joy-Con had some really bad disconnection issues, and eventually the company offered a similar program. While we would prefer for everything we buy to just you know, work. Having the option to get something we paid for get fixed for free when it's defective is pretty great, and we want that to continue going forward. Next at number four, let's talk about video game companies spending their money in a good direction for games sometimes. Now, you know, we often rightfully rail against these big corporations for their greedy AAA gaming trickery, but some of them, at the very least, put their money where their mouth is sometimes. Take Epic Games, for instance. Now, say what you will, I already hear some of you, but they were developers and tool makers first and foremost, and they seem committed to that. Through their Unreal Engine, they have something called Epic Mega Grants, where they've committed $100 million to support game developers of all sizes, as well as just enterprise, entertainment, education, and art projects. And again, they've rewarded $100 million in grants for these pitched projects. The way we look at it, more funding in the world to make cool stuff is a good thing. That is a positive. Ubisoft as well has went in with Epic Games to give funding to Blender, an open source animation tool and organization. There's a lot of focus on funding open source stuff here, which is great because it means everybody can get involved. The tools to make video games and the animations and stuff you love are not cheap. But sometimes, believe it or not, you get some easier access thanks to stuff like this. Now coming down to number three, we want to talk about hardware for a second because we were thinking of VR specifically. VR has had it kind of rough. We love it though. You know, it's chugging along, it's doing its thing, but it hasn't downright exploded. 
Uh, the PSVR in particular is doing well, but it's not the thing that like everybody needs yet. It's not exactly Ready Player One, but the Oculus Quest is released and it plays decent quality games completely wirelessly and without the need to plug into a PC. And the games are good, it's not just like mobile cell phone quality. The Rift also has moved to less wires and Valve has been getting more and more comfortable with wireless technology added onto their headsets. This is a good direction for VR. PC gaming is great, but for it to go mainstream and get more interest and then have more money to research and advance even further, these things need to be easier to just put on your head and get lost in a world. The PC would hold some people back. The size of the room or the length of the cable would hold people back. But thankfully, with new developments of the last year or so, we're getting there. VR is the best it's ever been and we just hope this trend continues to grow. Because if it does at the rate it's going, and if technology keeps ramping up, and if there is money behind it, we can get that VR technology that we all kind of dream of. But of course, that's just me. Now at number two, let's talk some consumer good, because CD Projekt Red does a lot of stuff that is just pro-consumer, and they have a lot of goodwill from gaming fans. But one thing I want to highlight is a smaller, nicer quote from their Twitter account recently that explained that no version of their upcoming game, Cyberpunk 2077, will have extra or different content. Like, if you pre-order or buy a big special edition, you don't get an extra side mission or a cool new skin. Everybody gets the same content and everybody's on a level playing field. They they explained in their Twitter account, every person that buys the game gets exactly the same in-game content, no matter if they buy it in pre-orders or release date or two years later. They want everybody who buys their thing to have the same thing, which is actually really refreshing. Keeps game purchasing a little more old fashioned. You know, you buy the thing, you get the game, that's it. Maybe expansion packs down the line, that's it. This is just a nice simple thing that we'd like to see continue over convoluted pre-order and pre-purchase structures. Cause things get kind of ridiculous, okay? I get it for games as a service games, they're way more content based, but for something that's more of just a single player RPG, I'd like it if they kept things simple like this. So props to CD Projekt Red. Now finally at number one, crossplay. You knew we'd bring it up. In the last year or two, crossplay has resurfaced as this worldwide conversation in gaming, and it seems like most people in our world would at least like the option. Not having to buy a different console to play a specific game with your friend online would just be a cool future to live in. And we're getting closer too. Look, Fortnite, Dauntless, and Rocket League have full crossplay support between all consoles and PC. Uh, having more choice with who you play with as multiplayer games continue to dominate is a very good thing for consumers of games, we think. Plenty of other games are halfway there. It's really just about all of these companies playing nice. It's not always gonna happen, but when it does, sometimes it can make the things we buy a bit better off and we just hope it becomes the norm one day when it's possible and when it makes sense. You know, earlier we talked about open source development, but really open platforms could make things a little better off, you know? But those are some things that we think are going to be positive gaming trends. These are some things that we've been enjoying watching develop and we just hope they continue because they could ultimately benefit the video game industry and just make it better for everyone. If you got any other tips or just good things in video games that you like seeing, let us know in the comments because we talk about the bad stuff all the time. Let's talk about some things that might or at least have the potential to get better. If you enjoyed this video, clicking the like button is the best way you can help us out. We really appreciate that. And if you're new, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.